Welcome to our broadcast today. I'm Ken Bear, a pastor at Faith Dialogue here in Celebration, Florida. Our ministry works cooperatively with all of the area churches in Celebration, including Celebration Community Church, Corpus Christi Catholic Church, Community Presbyterian Church, Illuminate Church, Celebration Anglican Fellowship, and Celebration Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our call to worship today is from the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 says this, it says, Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Today's worship, we have a treat for you. We have worship from Luke Heinz at uh, Celebration Community Church, as well as a special God Bless America from Community Presbyterian Church. Praise the Lord. mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is strong and 
Him perfectly. O great High Priest, whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on His hands. My name is written on His heart. I know that while in heaven He stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just is satisfied to look on Him and
for us Americans in our generation, it was 9-11. And what was meant to bring pain to our nation actually brought us together. And so as we remember 9-11, let's remember not only the attack against us, but the spirit that brought us together. The spirit of God that this nation was founded upon. And let's release that spirit afresh. Welcome back. Today we're picking up where we left off, and we'll be in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts. For the past few months, we've been continuing our, our sermon series that we call Unstoppable. It's a series based on the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles was the history of the early church as recorded by, the, by Dr. Luke, one of the writers of the Gospels as well. Uh, just last week, we looked at the story of Peter and Cornelius. It was an amazing story, and you're gonna see much of it re actually repeated today. And what we want you to focus on is how God orchestrated, how God was fully in control of this meeting between Peter and Cornelius. Now, today, Peter is going to be in Jerusalem, and he has to defend his ministry, defend what, what happened, actually, in Caesarea. Our title for today's message is Defending the Ministry. And we'll be reading from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners. And it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Uh, but I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved." And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon me as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So as we read this account from the 11th chapter of the book of Acts, you may be thinking, I think I've heard this before. Uh, did you think that? Did this story kind of uh, ring a bell? Well, it, it should have. If you were with us last week, much of what we just read, in fact, almost everything we just read, was actually also in chapter 10. It was in the previous chapter where the Lord said to Peter, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, there are, are 21 verses in, in chapter 10 that were dedicated to this, this same story. Peter's vision and the meeting with Cornelius and his family and friends and how the Holy Spirit fell on all of these Gentiles. So Luke, writing on a scroll, decided to preserve this conversation between Peter and the Jewish brothers in Jerusalem and records the, the entire encounter. Now, he, he likely condensed some of it, so probably some of the time period. He didn't talk about the route that Peter took back to Jerusalem, uh, or whether it took a few days or a few weeks. Um, he, um, he does quote Peter's report in its entirety, and it actually takes up another 18 verses, 387 words, over 4,000 characters. So. Why, if it's basically a repeat, why did Luke decide to record the entire account, to put in all of this dialogue into this, this book of Acts? Wouldn't it have been easier for Luke to have said, well, so Peter traveled back to Jerusalem and gave an account of everything that had happened. 13 words, easily said. But, and realize, this is, this is a long time ago. This is old school. This is before computers, before, before typewriters. According to one of my heroes of the faith, uh, Pastor Chuck Smith, um, Chuck, Chuck Smith says that Luke would have been recording this event on a, on a scroll. Uh, a book back in the first century was a scroll. Uh, Luke would write it on the scroll, unroll it a little bit, write some more, and then roll it back all up when he is, he's done. The large scrolls were 35 feet long. Temple scrolls that would have the writings of the prophet Isaiah, for example, or the prophet Jeremiah would be one of these large scrolls, and it would be, it would be kind of difficult to master. It would, work, it would be about 35, 35 pounds and 35 feet long. Uh, the book of Acts actually would fit on one of these large scrolls. You know, we live in, in such a, a modern age. We rarely even think of how, of how big our, our documents get because they're all stored digitally now. Uh, when I'm preparing a message like the one I'm doing today, I'll go on my computer and I'll grab entire books, books of the Bible, huge commentaries, and I'll uh, control, control C and I'll, and I'll just copy and paste them into a document for me to work on, rearrange, take those things that I want to be able to have, delete the rest. It's easy today, but it, but it wasn't so for Luke. If, if Luke records this and God wants it recorded twice, uh, that means that it's critically important. You know, if God says something once, it's important. If God says something twice in the Bible, it's like he's waving a flag trying to get our attention. Uh, you may have a, a King James Bible, or maybe you remember in the King James Bible, every now and then you'd be reading and it would say something like, verily, verily, uh, which is actually an old English word for what we would know as truly, truly. And it's mentioned twice like that to, to get our attention. If you've been to court or if you watch a, a TV shows that have a court at the very beginning before the, before the judge walks out, the, the, uh, the um, bailiff will say something like this. He'll say, hear ye, hear ye. Um, he'll say it twice. The court is now in session. And then everybody stands up, everybody gets the attention because the judge is walking into the courtroom. Something important is, is starting. So what is it about this account of Peter and Cornelius that's so important that God wants to, to wave a flag at us? He wants to make sure 
that he has our attention. I believe the key is found in not so much the sheet that was let down from heaven, but what the Lord's response is. Let me, let me read that to you. It says, Then I observed it intently, and considered I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice say to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. Peter's talking about these, these animals that are on the sheet, and they're not kosher. They're unclean. But here's the Lord's response, and I think this is key. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. So, so there's even more rep repetition within the story. The Lord loves to repeat things to make sure that we get it. Peter says that this vision of the sheet was actually given to him three times. The Lord is trying to get Peter's attention. Uh, now, for some of you guys, you probably relate. Uh, my wife is, has learned this. I mean, she knows that in order to get my attention, sometimes she needs to, to repeat her, herself. Uh, she wants to make sure that I, they understand what, what she's saying is important, and she wants to make sure that she gets my attention. So the main point here that I believe the Lord is emphasizing is that this pathway to heaven, pathway to salvation, uh, will always be through Jesus. And this pathway is now being extended to the Gentiles for the very first time. This gospel is going out into the entire world. Now Peter needed to see the vision three times, and he is now telling the story um, to the apostles and the brothers in Jerusalem because this is not something that was expected even though it really should have been. The prophets and Jesus had given plenty of clues that the entire world was going to benefit from not only the loins of Abraham but from the ministry of the Messiah. It said that all of the nations would be blessed and that word nation is the word ethnos which means to all of the people, all of the people, including the Gentiles, not just the, the Jews. So let's look at these verses a little closer and see what else the Lord may be telling us. Verse 1 says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men, and ate with them. Now, Peter likely didn't initiate this meeting, but felt compelled to go back to Jerusalem to explain himself, to defend his ministry. After Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church that was, was stoned by an angry mob, and, and Saul was actually there, there was a great persecution, the Bible says, that broke out against the, the church. At the time, the church was called the Way. The believers were scattered through all the regions of Judea and Samaria. And the Bible says, however, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. The apostles in Jerusalem would have included Peter. And Peter, had he not been in Joppa, had he not been on a mission from God, would have been there in Jerusalem with the rest of the brothers. Uh, but again, he had called, uh, the Lord had called Peter to Samaria to be able to, to preach and to be able to, to witness to the believers there. I'll go one step further, and I'll step out a little bit on a limb here, but I'll say, had the situation been reversed, and Peter had remained in Jerusalem, and any of the other apostles, uh, Matthew or John or James or Barnabas or any of the others, would have gone to a Caesarea, and this account had happened, Peter would be right there with the circumcision. Uh, requiring an answer why these things were done. Why did one of the apostles go into the Gentiles and go into his house and, and eat with them? The circumcision party is demanding to know why, they had, why Peter had done these things. So, so Peter returns to Jerusalem, and he's in the unenviable position of having to defend himself in the ministry. Uh, he's an apostle, after all. I mean, I thought... 
I thought he was the he was the guy. He was one of the inner three, and Peter finds himself having to defend himself. The scripture says that the apostles and brothers had heard that the Gentiles also had received uh, the word of God. You know, it said that good news travels fast and bad news even faster. You know, we look back from our perspective and we realize what great news this is that God is pouring out his spirit onto the Gentiles. Uh, this is, uh, they're becoming part of the beloved. They're becoming part of the body of Christ. Uh, they're part of the community of, of God's grace. However, notice in the next verse it says, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying you went into the uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now this, this word contended uh, is such a polite word. Uh, it's kind of like the way the news today talks about the peaceful protesters. You know, it's, 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 it's covering over what's actually happening here. Contended means much more than just questioning or wondering. For example, in the story of Nehemiah, who went to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and found that the exiles that had come back to Jerusalem were starting to fraternize and to intermarry with the Gentiles. Nehemiah said, and I contended with them, there's that same word, and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God saying, we shall not give your daughters unto your sons uh, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for themselves. I mean, uh, Nehemiah uh, makes it very, very clear what his intentions are and this is the idea of contending with some other group. Further, in today's passage, this contention was coming from the party of the circumcision, who would later be called uh, the Judaizers. Now, the word Judaizer comes from uh, the Greek word meaning, uh, a Greek word meaning to, to live according to Jewish customs, to live according to Jewish customs. They're just called Judaizers. Throughout the history of the church, throughout the history of the church, where God's grace is, is given out freely to all of those who call upon the name of the Lord. There's always been a group within the church, there's always been a group that always wants it to be grace plus something else. In the case of the Judaizers, it was grace plus all of the Jewish law. Today it may be grace plus church membership or grace plus baptism, or maybe it's grace plus baptizing a certain way or by a certain denomination. Uh, the early church had a deal specifically, however, with these Judaizers, and we'll come across them again uh, in Acts chapter 15 in a few weeks. And the Apostle Paul will have a few run-ins with these Judaizers as well. It is for this reason that the story is repeated twice in its entirety. And it's also uh, for this reason that we'll actually see two things as a result. Number one, the first is that God orchestrated this entire event. Back in chapter 10, we saw an angel of God had appeared to, to uh, Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and told him that his prayers had been answered and, and that he gave him specific instructions to send men to Joppa to find um, Peter, um, and, and to bring Peter back because Peter was going to show them the way of salvation. Meanwhile, Peter had this vision of the sheet three times. And what we know is that there was all kinds of non-kosher foods on there, non-kosher animals. And the vision told him um, that uh, the, the word, the, the, uh, the uh, message from heaven said he was to, to kill and eat and he was not to call anything that God had cleansed to be common. Plus, when the men from Cornelius had, had sent, actually arrived where Peter was staying, again, a word from heaven, a word from the Spirit of God, told Peter to go with the men, uh, fearing nothing. See, this was, this was all God's doing. Uh, if the gospel was going to be preached to all the world, it was going to take something special. God's special anointing, God's special action. God was going to orchestrate this so that the gospel would go not only to the Gentiles, but somebody like Peter would see what God was doing.
Now, the second thing that happened was that God ended up saving these Gentiles. Uh, we've already read the story of the Holy Spirit falling on these Gentiles. Peter said it was a sign that they were accepted, and then he commanded that they be baptized. So Peter tells them the story. Peter defends his ministry because while Peter was doing exactly what the Lord had commanded, um, and not only commanded Peter step by step, the Judaizers still weren't willing to embrace what God was doing. While these Judaizers in, Je in Jerusalem, and quite frankly, Peter the Apostle, was bound by, were bound by tradition, <laughs> aren't you glad the Holy Spirit is not? It is for these reasons that the story is repeated in chapter 11. The Holy Spirit wants to make sure he gets our attention. So let's continue. Verse number 12 says this. It says, Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who, who will tell you the words by which you and all your household are to be saved. Notice that Peter is making sure that the apostles and brothers understand that this was not his doing. Uh, Peter, in essence, says, the Spirit did it. Uh, the Spirit told me to do it. Uh, the Spirit made me do it. Peter doesn't take the blame, responsibility, or the credit. This was all the Spirit's doing. He tells them two important things. Number one, the Spirit told me to go with them. And number two, six brethren accompanied me. Notice that Cornelius had sent three men to go get Peter, but Peter sent six men back with him to see Cornelius. Now, this was actually a very smart decision by Peter, as these six brothers are now six eyewitnesses. Six eyewitnesses, and it's obvious that these six eyewitnesses are with Peter as he's talking to the apostles and the other brothers in Jerusalem. Whether Peter knew that he would be having to defend his ministry or not, this was critical as the testimony of a multitude of witnesses strengthens the case. Remember, that's why Jesus had 12 apostles, there were 120 on the day of Pentecost, and then when Jesus rose from the dead, the Bible says there were over 500 that saw the resurrected Christ on 12 separate occasions. Lots of testimony, lots of eyewitnesses. You know, I, I, find it e I find it interesting also that either Peter didn't report what he had actually said uh, in his testimony in giving the gospel uh, to these Gentiles, or that Luke didn't re record it. But at the same time, it actually strengthens our point today that this is all about that salvation is, is a gift of the Spirit of God. It, it's all about grace plus nothing else. There are often now many things that accompany salvation or are used to bring us to the point of making a decision for Jesus Christ. You know, we hear the gospel, we're often convicted of our sins, uh, the word of God penetrates our spirit, and typically most people respond in, in some way, depending on the traditions of the church or depending how the person is wired. You know, some people will, will pray. Some people will get on their hands and knees and, and call out to God for forgiveness. Uh, some people will be in a church and they, and they raise their hand. Uh, these are all things that, that, that accompany salvation, but they're not the requirements for salvation. Now, many may find fault in, in my words, and if you're watching this, you may be one of them because your tradition, your theology has taught you something different. But I'm going to pull a Peter. I'm pulling a Peter. It wasn't me. It, it, it was the Holy Spirit. These are not my words that I'm giving you. This is not my theology. This is not my gospel. This is what the Bible clearly says. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. You know, this topic of grace plus nothing could actually fill at least two or three sermons. There are whole books that are written on this, this general topic 
of what's required in salvation. This idea of grace being all about God. This is, this is God's doing. Uh, we'll save that, however, for another day. I, I've spoken on this, this gospel truth before, and it's not unusual that I'll get a lot of questions, a lot of comments, even probably from uh, some of our YouTube um, viewers. We'll get, we'll get comments questioning this, this point. Uh, and like I said last week, this chapter 10 and 11 is going to mess with your, with your theology. I, I will address one of the most frequent questions before it's even asked. And one of the most frequent questions I get is, is repentance necessary for salvation? Is repentance necessary for salvation? Uh, in order to answer that question, uh, we need to give more than just a, a yes or no answer. If the question, is repentance necessary for salvation, means that does a person need to fully repent of all of their sins that he or she has committed or are committing and, and agree to stop sinning in the future before they can be saved. If that's the actual question, it's a simple no. That is not required at all, not according to the Gospels. Again, because of the verse we mentioned before in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, as well as the words that are recorded in the Gospel of John. John says, but as many as received him, this is Jesus. This is talking about Jesus. To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We're born of God. It's the grace of God. If, however, going back to the question, is repentance required for our salvation? If, however, by asking is repentance necessary means that with salvation, is there a change of mind? And that's what repentance means. Is there a change of mind in that uh, we begin to start thinking differently about our own life and about who Jesus is and that our attitude is one that seeks to, to serve God, to pursue holiness and repent of wickedness? Well, Paul gave this same teaching to Timothy. He said, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In this way, true repentance is a result of the grace of God and the favor of God and accompanies a man or a woman when they are, when they are saved, when they're made new, when they're made righteous in the, in the eyes of God. So let's continue, verse number 15. And, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. And he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know, Peter chose his words very carefully. And as I began to speak, he says, the Holy Spirit fell on them as it was on us at the beginning. You can almost hear Peter saying, it, it wasn't me, the Spirit did it, I didn't do anything. Now let's go back to the Judaizers and remember their objection. The Judaizers said, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, Peter was, was very polite in responding to their objections. He, he doesn't call them names, he doesn't malign or criticize their complaint as if they were actually uncaring about the need for the gospel to be preached to the, all the nations. He is circumspect in his reply. He also quickly attributes it to the Spirit of God. It wasn't Peter doing the work. Now Jesus didn't have that option. He couldn't point to the Holy Spirit and say, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. And I think Jesus would have answered this objection by these the party of the circumcision, these Judaizers, differently than Peter did. These Judaizers may mean well, but they're actually following the practices that the Pharisees had. The Pharisees were more interested in the faithful practices of man-made religion than the redemption, or, redemption of a, or the healing of a man or woman. Let me jog your memory a bit and read a little more from the Gospel of Luke. Now I could have picked any one of a half a dozen, maybe eight or nine different accounts that were very similar to this one. But this account in Luke, I think, speaks directly 
to the problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees and that Jesus would have had with these Judaizers. Luke chapter 13 says this, it says, One Sabbath day as Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, he saw a, a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent over double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said, Dear woman, you're healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand upright and she praised God. But, there's always a but, isn't there? But the leader in charge of the synagogue, who was a Pharisee, a Sadducee, was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd, Come on those days to be healed, not the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, listen to Jesus' words, You hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? The shamed his enemies and all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things that Jesus did. These Judaizers were more interested in form over substance. They were more interested in the form than the actual substance. They were more interested in the symbol rather than the reality. And this example that I read, Jesus healed a woman who had been doubled over for 18 years. For 18 years there was no change of view. She, she could only look down at her shoes. That's, that's all she saw. And Jesus healed her. The miracle not only set this woman free, but clearly indicated that God was alive, that Jesus was the Messiah, that things were good in Israel, that the healing power of God was on Jesus and that he was able to, to speak the word and it would be done for him. Now, it's not being unfair to the Judaizers. Paul had very sharp words for these Judaizers as well. In all fairness, these Judaizers that Paul talks about probably were not the same that Peter is addressing. They're just called the party of the circumcision. However, it's the same attitude. And not only do we see it in the time of Jesus and Peter and Paul, but too often we see it today as well. In chapter, of, in chapter 3 of the letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. And the mutilation of flesh refers exactly to the concept of circumcision given to an adult, adult male. A very painful um, operation to say the least. Let's continue in today's message, verse number 16. Then I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when he, we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Notice how Peter is bringing into this discussion the, the word of God. He actually quotes John the Baptist in, in Mark uh, chapter 1 verse 8 and the future opportunity of of all of us being baptized with the Holy Spirit Peter wasn't just reporting what he had seen he was also providing the scriptural and historical context of what was happening experience alone doesn't mean you can say well this is of God some of our experiences are of God and some are just random experiences it's the Word of God that tests all things that proves all things. Peter then says, If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? You see, Peter recognized the work of God just as he recognized the same gift, the same type of experience that he experienced on Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit that came experientially. That means something was happening, meaning that they experienced it. It wasn't just a wonder. It wasn't just something uh, spiritual. This was also physical. It was a happening. They experienced the Holy Ghost. They, they praised God. Peter said it was the same as they had experienced at Pentecost, likely meaning languages, 
unknown and unlearned languages clearly praising God. So let's wrap up this teaching. And actually, the last verse is the, is the best. So we save the best for last. Verse 18. When we heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance of life. You know, often the best response when God does something amazing, awesome, and inspiring, the best response is exactly what happened here. Silence. Just take it in. Now, many people don't like silence. Salesmen have a tendency to to want to fill the silence. They they keep on talking. They keep on selling something. They want to close the deal. Even when there's nothing more to say, they keep on talking. Theologians can be like that too. And I'm, I know I'm a little hard on theologians, and actually my degree is pastoral theology, so I, I get included with the rest of them. But theologians are often like that. They have to have the last word. They want to tell you all the things that you really don't even need to know. They have a wonderful mastery of Greek and Hebrew. They understand doctrine and the principles of the creeds and, uh, and the history of the church. All of that be, can be helpful, but often the best response is silence. The Bible says that these uh, apostles and brothers of the circumcision, they, they became silent. They glorified God and said, God has granted to the Gentiles the repentance of life. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this, this message today. We love that you sometimes repeat yourself. And in repeating yourself, you're, you're getting our attention, Lord. So help us pay attention to what you have to say. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory, Lord, as we grow in Christ. I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your friendship and your prayers. And many of you are sharing these messages with your friends. And I appreciate that. We really do. On our website at www.faithdialogue.org, you'll see of all of our video messages, all of our audio podcasts. Uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your prayers. God bless you.